Greetings, CubeSat Developers Workshop. My name is Jaron Ashcraft. I'm a second year PhD student at the Wine College of Optical Sciences, and I'm here today to present our project, the Versatile CubeSat Telescope, going to large apertures in small spacecraft. This project is an interdisciplinary collaboration between three laboratories across two universities. Uh, first, my lab is the University of Arizona Space Astrophysics Laboratory, led by Dr. Ewan Douglas. We specialize in space mission payload development and high contrast imaging. Joining us at the University of Arizona is the Large Optics Fabrication and Testing Group, led by Dr. Daewoo Kim, who specializes in optical design, fabrication, and freeform optical testing. Across the nation, we have MIT Star Lab joining the project, uh, led by Dr. Kerry Cahoy, who specializes in nanosatellite development, remote sensing, and exoplanet detection. These three laboratories have gotten together to answer a, a problem we've identified, and that's that optical resolution in CubeSats is volume limited. You know, CubeSats can only get so big, and you can only have uh, so big of a primary mirror fit into a CubeSat. And with the addition of the mounting optics that need to go around said primary mirror, there really isn't a lot of space. We know from diffraction theory that the Rayleigh criterion specifies optical resolution, uh, holding focal lengths constant, that is. If you have a larger entrance pupil diameter, your resolution is better. And consequently, you get better throughput. So we want to answer the question, how can we increase entrance pupil diameter to get better resolution and better throughput? To answer this question, we look to diamond turning. Now, diamond turning has been shied away from in the optical regime because of the tooling marks resulting in mid-spatial frequency errors that degrade your performance in the optical. But recent advances out of the Korean Basic Science Institute have introduced MRF polishing to actually correct these mid-spatial frequency errors, enabling really, really good surface quality, especially in the optical performance, meaning that we have access to diamond turning or optical telescopes in space. And the advantage of diamond turning is that you can diamond turn a primary mirror directly onto mounting hardware in the CubeSat so that you don't need mounting optics around it, meaning that you can have a larger entrance pupil, a larger primary mirror in your CubeSat payload, which is really excellent. Another big challenge for space optics is that pointing is very challenging to maintain. The presence of thermal gradients across your CubeSat um, and any mechanical oscillations that may be present will dynamically misalign your telescope. And so we introduce fast steering mirrors into our design that can dynamically adjust and compensate for pointing by using these piezoelectric uh, MEMS devices to introduce tilt into the optical beam to compensate for any tilt that is sensed upstream, effectively nulling any misalignments that are a result of thermal gradients or mechanical oscillations. Now that we've armed ourselves with large high performance mirrors and uh, fast steering mirrors that can dynamically adjust any pointing, uh, the three laboratories introduced previously aim to design versatile four optics that can deliver light from a desired scene to a research payload at the back end that balance high performance, which includes light collection and resolution, with low sensitivity to things like misalignment and thermal gradients. To develop these versatile four optics, we had to come up with some optical specifications, and we sought really high performance designs, so we looked to really high performance specifications. This features a really large entrance pupil diameter, a 95 millimeter entrance pupil diameter for a 20% obscured on axis design, and an 87 millimeter entrance pupil diameter for an off axis unobscured design, which is then magnified to an exit pupil diameter of five millimeters. This is a really high magnification, which will be challenging in the design process, but we'll see how that goes later. Uh, we want a half field of view of 0.2 degrees and essentially diffraction limited, really well corrected performance across the field of view. Uh, these were really, really challenging specifications, but are feasible through aspheric solutions to our mirrors, which are accessible to us because we're diamond turning the optics anyways. For these specifications, our group developed two designs to compare, see which one performed better for our specifications. The first one is an on-axis system, which is a ritchie Chretien objective for the primary and secondary conic mirrors here, which uh, is then 
which produce an image which is then collimated by a plano convex aspheric collimator. This feeds the light to a pair of fast staring mirrors. We have two in this design and ultimately sends the light to the research payload. So we have really well corrected light, which is then dynamically adjusted for pointing and then goes to our science stuff. The second design we came up with is a little more new. It is an off axis uh, uh, Ritchie Shretien objective. So this uh, primary mirror is decentered from the secondary in order to get out, out of the way of the obscuration. This forms an image here and is then picked up by a freeform mirror that serves as the collimator, which then gets redirected to our fast steering mirror pair and then the research payload. By virtue of being an on-axis system, the on-axis telescope is much easier to manufacture and test because the solution is much more well characterized. People have been developing Cassegrain type Ritchie Shretien objectives for a while, but they have this secondary obscuration. This limits the amount of light available to the telescope. We also have less packaging control because everything needs to be, well, all of the optics need to be coaxial and in this train. We can't do any fancy folding in order to minimize our packaging format. The off-axis telescope, on the other hand, is unobscured and, and we don't need as big of a primary mirror to get the same amount of flux as the on-axis system. The freeform mirror also grants us considerably more packaging control with all the degrees of freedom available to us, so we were able to tighten up the telescope assembly here quite a bit. Unfortunately, it's quite a bit harder to assemble and manufacture. The, just the off-axis conics make the alignment process much more challenging, and the freeform mirror further complicates that. We also expect this design to be more sensitive to misalignments, and that's something we aim to study later. After developing these two designs, we evaluated against our specifications table and indeed found that both designs satisfy all of our specifications. Now we needed another metric of comparison, so we looked to alignment sensitivity to compare the two systems. To evaluate the alignment sensitivity of each system, we locally perturbed each optic in each system in six degrees of freedom and evaluated how the performance degraded as we perturbed in the six degrees of freedom. The performance metric we use is Stro ratio, which I've kind of humorously called an astronomer's ruler because of its prevalence in diffraction limited imaging systems. The Stro ratio is the ratio of the peak intensity of the PSF of your instrument with respect to the peak intensity of the PSF that diffraction theory says your point spread function should be and is a uh, good metric when you are in a situation where you have little monochromatic aberration, which is the case for our on-axis and off-axis telescopes. We use the sensitivity analysis to evaluate what tolerance degraded at our st instrument strel ratio to less than 0.8 and found that as expected, the on-axis system was considerably less sensitive. You can misalign all of the optics much more than the off-axis system and this is a virtue of the rotational symmetry of the design. So we have a winner and we'll continue mechanical developments with this system to further flesh out the concept of a versatile CubeSat payload. The mechanical requirements are as follows. The telescope volume will be confined to within a 2U payload. The mass of the telescope assembly as well as the optics will be less than four kilograms, but we're trying to hit less than two kilograms as a goal. The instrument module interface will be a flexible generic hole pattern that is mounted to the rear of the primary mirror. The optical clear aperture will be maintained from the original design, 95 millimeters for the on-axis system. And the optical obscuration will be maintained uh, no greater than 20%. Based on the sensitivity analysis I just presented, the optical alignment will be to within 20 micron positioning of all of the elements and we'll analyze the launch survival, operational temperature differential, and survivable temperature range in the upcoming analysis. Based on those mechanical specifications, our team at Stewart Observatory was able to put together the optical telescope assembly, which is a solid model representing the mechanics that hold our optics. These gray lines here represent optical rays emanating from a scene on the left, propagating from left to right, hitting the primary mirror, M1. 
which is mounted to the in instrument module interface I just brought up, is via a series of flexures colored here in orange, and we'll get to that later. The light then propagates from M1 to M2, forms an intermediate image here, and is then collimated by L3 to send the light to the instrument interface, and this is where a fast steering mirror would go. The entire OTA is ensconced in a barrel to mitigate stray light as well. After the completion of the solid model, we were able to migrate it to a finite element analysis model to analyze a couple of things. First, for survivability margins, we were interested in completing a structural analysis for baseline sizing against MAC loading and modal requirements, as well as being able to check the survivability for thermal stress and strains. Uh, and what this tells us is based on the interface between the primary mirror here via the flexures to the instrument module interface hex plate here, we're able to generate surface deflections or uh, surface figure deformations across the primary mirror and then analyze how that affects performance. And this is an iterative process that affects the telescope design that I'll go into in the next slide. This is a pictographic representation of that iterative process. We begin here where we analyze the OTA for survivability and neck loading and modal requirements and then use this to generate surface figure errors across the primary mirror due to the assumed machine tolerances, and then generate uh, figure errors due to the assumed change in temperature between the instrument module interface, the hex plate, and the primary mirror. We then export the, these surface deflection files and load them into the ray trace software that we use to design the telescope to evaluate if the performance is met with margin. If it is, then the design's final, we're good, but if it's not, we refine the design and tolerances and the assumptions on the thermal environment, and repeat it all again. Here are some preliminary thermal finite element analysis results, sort of an intermediate step in the iterative process we just went over. Uh, here we present a 50 degree Fahrenheit temperature differential between the hex plate shown here and the primary mirror. On the left here, we have uh, some exaggerated deflection shown in the flexures, so you can see how they're kind of buckling due to the temperature in order to hold the mirror steady. And on the right, we see the corresponding mirror surface figure, figure deflection. It takes this characteristic trefoil shape, and through this analysis, we've identified that we can anticipate a 10 nanometer per one degree Celsius trefoil magnitude for temperature differentials between the hex plate and mirror one. Just to recap, here's a couple drawings showcasing our optical telescope assembly so that you can see it in more detail. Uh, right here is similar to the slide shown before. Here's the primary mirror, the secondary, the instrument's forward interface. Uh, and here's the back of the hex plate with the flexures shown in the previous slide after doing the finite element analysis. The great thing about this design is that it's pretty lightweighted and we baseline the mass at less than one kilogram, so this uh, far exceeds our specifications. The path forward to developing the versatile CubeSat telescope is to continue the flexure development informed by the ray trace software and finite element analysis and ultimately prototype the versatile CubeSat telescope. Uh, for in a laboratory for experimental verification, which we hope to do in partnership with the Korea Basic Science Institute, who will be manufacturing our optics for us. Here's a fun slide showing the actual optical telescope assembly printed, which is cool for a sense of scale. Uh, here's the back of the optical telescope assembly, hex plates, you can kind of see the support flexures there. There's the barrel that holds the primary mirror and secondary together. This is the front showcasing the secondary and the support structure that mounts it to the barrel. Here's the back of M1 and our sort of preliminary plan for light weighting it. These are the placeholder flexures in this print and the hex plate, which is light weighted kind of similarly. In conclusion, this presentation aims to demonstrate our laboratory's collective efforts in the development of a versatile CubeSat telescope tailored to high performance research payloads on CubeSat platforms, enabled by recent advances in diamond turning, active pointing control, and just the ability to have an ensemble of aspheric mirrors in a CubeSat telescope platform.
I'd also like to take a second to thank ZMAX for giving us early access to the FEA surface fitting tool in Optic Studio, which is the ray trace software we've been using to design the telescope and evaluate its performance.